Okay, so this is called the Mead of the Poets. Do you wonder where poetry comes from? Where we get the songs we sing and the tales we tell? Do you ever ask yourself how it is that some people can dream great, wise, beautiful dreams and pass those dreams on as poetry to the world? To be sung and retold as long as the sun rises and, rises and sets? As long as the moon will wax and wane? Have you ever wondered why some people make beautiful songs and poems and tales and some of us do not? It is a long story and it does no credit to anyone. There is murder in it and trickery, lies and foolishness, seduction and pursuit. Listen, it began long, not long after the dawn of time, in a war between the gods. The Aesir fought the Veneer. The Aesir were warlike gods of battle and conquest. The Veneer were softer brother and sister gods and goddesses who made the soils fertile and the plants grow, but nonetheless powerful for that. The gods of the Veneer and the Aesir were too well matched. Neither side could win the war, and more than that, as they fought, they realized that each side needed the other. And there is no joy in a brave battle unless you have fine fields and farms to feed, to feed you in the feasting that follows. And so... Uh, they came together to negotiate a peace, and once the negotiations were concluded, they marked their truce by each of them, Aesir and Veneer alike, one by one, spitting into a vat. As their spit mingled, so was their agreement made binding. Then they had a feast. Food was eaten, mead was drunk, and they caroused and joked and talked and boasted and laughed as the fires became glowing coals until the sun crept up above the horizon. Then, as the Asir and the Veneer roused themselves to leave, to wrap themselves in furs and cloth, and step out into the crisp snow and the morning mist, Odin said, It would be a shame to leave our mingled spittle behind us. Frey and Freya, brother and sister, were leaders of the Veneer who would stay with the Aesir in Asgard from now on under the terms of the truce. They nodded. We could make something from it, said Frey. We should make a man, said Freya, and she reached into the vat. The spittle transformed and took shape as her fingers moved, and in moments it had taken on the appearance of a man and stood before naked in, of a man and stood naked before them. You are Vasir, said Odin, said Odin, and know who I am do you know who I am? You are Odin all highest, said Vizier. You are Grimnir and the third. You have other names too, many to list, uh, too many to list in this place. But I know them all. And I know the poems and the chants and the kennings to go, that, that go with them. Vizier made the joining of the Aesir and the Vanir was the wisest of the gods. He combined head and heart. The gods jostled with each other to be the next to ask him questions and his answers to them were always wise. He observed keenly, and he interpreted what he saw correctly. Soon enough, Vasir turned to the gods and said, I'm going to travel now. I'm going to see the nine worlds, see Midgard. There are questions to be answered that I have not yet been asked. But you will come back to us, they asked. I will come back, said Vasir. There is the mystery of the net, after all which one day will need to be untangled. The what? asked Thor. But Vasir merely smiled, and he left the gods puzzling over his words, and he, put him on tra and he put on a traveling cloak, and he left Asgard and walked the Rainbow Bridge. Vasir went from town to town, from village to village. He met people of all kinds, and he treated them well and answered their questions, and there was not a place but was the better for Vasir's stopping there. In those days, two dark elves who lived in a fortress by the sea, they did magic there. And feats of alchemy, like all dwarves, they built things, wonderful, remarkable things, in their workshop and their forge. But there were things they had not yet, 
but there were things they had not yet made, and making those things obsessed them. They were brothers and were called Fialar and Galar, and they had heard that Kvis, that Vizier was visiting a town nearby. They set out to meet him. Fialar and Galar and Vizier found Vizier in their great hall, answering questions for the townsfolk, amazing all who listened. Sorry, um, I haven't read in a while. I need a drink, and I'm not speaking very well. My tongue is a little, uh, a little dry. I'll be right back. Alright, I got me some water, there we go, wow that camera focuses the, uh, and it does the, uh, the, um, the auto white really quickly, back and forth, that's crazy, I wonder why it's going back and forth so fast like that, oh well, uh, not much I can do about it, besides, you're not here to watch, you're here to listen, okay, so, uh, let's see, blah, 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 townsfolk, or blah, 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 um, amazing all who listened, okay, he told the people how to purify water, and how to make cloth from nettles, uh, he told one woman exactly who had stolen her knife, and why, once he was done talking, and the townsfolk had fed him, the dwarves approached, we have a question to ask you, that you may have never, uh, that you have never been asked before, they said, but it must be asked in private. Will you come with us? I will come, said Vasir. They walked to the fortress. The seagulls screamed, and the brooding gray clouds were the same shade as the gray of the waves. The dwarves led Vasir. <sighs> Sorry, it's spelled K V A S I R, but it's just, you just don't pronounce the K. It's just Vasir. Um. I, I forget sometimes, though, uh, and try and say Kvasir, um, which, uh, it's just Vasir. Um, uh, deep within the walls of their, okay, the, war, the dwarves led Vasir to their, to their workshop deep within the walls of their fortress. What are those, asked Vasir. They are vats. They are called Sun and Bodin. I see. And what is that over there? How can you be so wise when you do not know these things? It is a kettle. We call it Odrerir, ecstasy giver. And I see over here you have buckets of honey you have gathered. It is uncapped and liquid. Indeed we do, said Fjellar. Uh, Galar looked scornful. If you were as wise as you say you are, you would know what our question to you would be before we asked it. And you would know what these things are for. Vasir nodded in a resigned way. It seems to me, he said, that if you both, that if you were both intelligent and evil, you might have decided to kill your visitor, and let his blood flow into the vat's son and Bowden, and then you would heat his blood gently in your kettle, Odrir, Od, it's spelled O D R E R I R, Odrir. 
It's a, it's hard to say. Sorry. Um, Odrarir. Uh, and after that, you would blend uncapped honey into the mixture and let it ferment until it became mead. The finest mead. A drink that will intoxicate anyone who drinks it, but also give anyone who tastes it the gift of poetry and the gift of scholarship. We are intelligent, admitted Galar. And perhaps there are those who might think, he is, think us evil. And with that, he slashed uh, Vasir's throat, and they hung Vasir by his feet above the vats until the last drop of his blood was drained. They warmed the blood and the honey in the kettle called Odrarir, and did other things uh, to it of their own devising. They put it berries into it and stirred it with a stick. It bubbled, and then it ceased bubbling, and both of them sipped it and laughed, and each of the brothers found the verse and the poetry inside himself that he had never let out. The gods came the next morning. Vasir, they said, he was last seen with you. Yes, said the dwarves, he came back with us, but when he realized that we are only dwarfs and foolish and lacking in wisdom, he choked on his own knowledge. If only we had been able to ask him questions. He died, you say? Yes, said Fjellar and Galar, and they gave the gods Vasir's then they gave the gods Vasir's bloodless body to take back to Asgard. And for, God, and, uh, and for a god's funeral, and perhaps because gods are not as others, and death is not always permanent for them, for a god's eventual return. Thus it was that the, po that the dwarfs uh, had the meat of wisdom and poetry, and any per person who wished to taste it needed to beg it from the dwarfs. But Gela and Fjellar made the meat only to those they liked. Uh, they, uh, and they liked nobody but themselves. Still, there were those to whom they had obligations. The giant Gilling, for example, and his wife. The dwarfs invited them to come and visit the fortress, and one winter's day they came. Let us go rowing in our boat, the dwarfs told Gilling. The giant's weight made the boat ride low in the water, and the dwarfs rowed the boat into the rocks just under the surface. Always before their boat had floated serenely above the rocks. Not this time. The boat crashed onto the rocks and overturned, throwing the giant into the sea. Swim back to the boat, the brothers called to Gilling. I cannot swim, he said, and that was the last thing he said, for a wave filled his open mouth with salt water, and his head hit the rocks, and in a moment he was lost to view. Fjellar and Galar righted their boat and went home. Gilling's wife was waiting for them. Where is my husband? she asked. Him? said Galar. Oh, he's dead. Drowned? asked Fjellar, added Fjellar, helpfully. Uh, at this, the giant's wife wailed and sobbed as if each cry ripped from her soul. She called to her dead husband and swore she, she would love him always. And she cried and moaned and wept. <clears throat> Hush, said Galar. Your weeping and wailing hurts my ears. It's very loud. I expect that's because you're a giant. But the giant's wife simply wept the louder. Here, said Fjellar, would it help if we showed you the place where your husband died? She sniffed and nodded and cried and wailed and keened for her husband, who would never come back to her. Stand just over there, and we will point it out to you, said Fjellar, showing her exactly where she should stand, that she should go through the great door and stand beneath the wall of the fortress. And he nodded to his brother, who scurried up off up the steps to the wall above. As Gilling's wife walked through the door, Gala dropped a huge stone on her head, and she fell, her, her skull half-crushed. Good job, said Fjellar. I was getting very tired of those dreadful noises. They pushed the woman's lifeless body off the, off the rocks and into the sea. The fingers of the gray waves dragged the body away from them, and Gilling's wife and Gilling were reunited in death. The dwarfs shrugged and believed themselves to be extremely clever in their fortress by the sea. They drank the meat of poetry each night, 
and declaimed great and beautiful verses to each other, made mighty sagas about the death of Gilling and Gilling's wife, which they declaimed from the rooftop of their fortress, and eventually each night they slept, insensible, and woke where they had sat or fallen down the night before. One day they woke as usual, but they did not wake in their fortress. They woke on the floor of their boat, and a giant, whom they did not recognize, were rowing it into the waves. The sky was dark with storm clouds, and the sea was black. The waves were high and rough, and the salt water splashed over the side of the dwarves' boat, soaking them. Uh, who are you? asked the dwarves. I am Sudding, said the giant. I heard you were bragging to the wind and the waves and the world about having killed my, my father and mother. Ah, said Galar, does that explain why you have tied us up? It does, said Sudding. Perhaps you are taking us to a glorious place, said Fjellar, hopefully, where you will untie us, and there we will feast and drink and laugh and become the best of friends. I do not believe so, said Sudding. It was low tide. They were rocks jutting out over the wa above the water. They were the same rocks upon which the high tide the dwarf's, head, the dwarf's boat had overturned on which Gilling had drowned, Sudding picked up each of the dwarves, took him from the bottom of the boat, and placed him on the rocks. These rocks will be covered by the sea at high tide, said Fjellar. Our hands are tied behind our backs. We cannot swim. If you leave us here, we will undoubtedly drown. That is certainly the intention, said Sudding. He smiled then for the first time. And as you drown, I shall sit in this, your boat, and I shall watch you take, and I shall watch the sea take you both. Then I shall return home to Jotunheim, and I will tell my brother Balgi, and my daughter Gunlid, how you died, and how we will be satisfied that my mother and father were appropriately avenged. The sea began to rise. It covered the dwarves' feet. Then it came up to their navels. Soon enough, the dwarves' beards were floating in the foam. There was panic in their eyes. Mercy, they called. Like the mercy you gave my mother and my father? We will compensate you for their deaths. We will make it up to you. We will pay you. I do not believe that you dwarves possess anything that could compensate me for my parents' deaths. I am a wealthy giant. I have many servants in my mountain, for in my mountain fastness. And all the riches I could dream of, gold I have, and precious stones, and iron enough to make a thousand swords. I am the master of mighty magics. What could you give me that I do not already have? asked Sudden. The dwarf said nothing at all. The waves continued to rise. We have mead. The mead of poetry, sputtered Galar as the water brushed his lips. Made of Vasir's blood, wisest of all the gods, shouted Fjellar. Two vats and a kettle, all filled with it. No one has it but us. No one in the whole world. Sudden scratched his head. I must think about this. I must ponder. I must reflect. Do not stop and think. If you think, we will drown, Fie uh, shouted Fjellar over the roar of the waves. The tide rose. Waves were splashing over the dwarves' heads, and they were gulping air, and their eyes were round with fear when Sudden the giant reached out and plucked first Fjellar and then Galar from the waves. The meat of poetry will be adequate compensation. It is a fair price. If you throw in a few other things, and I am sure you dwarfs have a few other things, I shall spare your lives. He tossed them still bound and soaking into the bottom of the boat, where they wriggled uncomfortably, like a couple of bearded lobsters, and he rowed back to shore. Um, uh, Sudding took the meat and mead the dwarves had made from, from Vasir's blood. He took other things from them as well, and he left the place, and he left those dwarves who were, all things considered, happy enough to have gotten away with their lives. Fjellar and Galar told people who passed their uh, fortress the story of how ill-used they had been by sudding. They told it in the market the next day, the next they went to trade. They told it when ravens were near in Asgard at the high. At, when, they told it when ravens were near. In Asgard, at his high seat, Odin sat, and his ravens, Hagen and Munin, 
whispered to him of the things they had seen and heard as they had wandered the world. Odin's one eye flashed when he heard the tale of Sudding's Mead. The people who heard the story called the Mead of Poetry the Ship of the Dwarves, since it had uh, floated Shielar and Galar off the rocks and taken them safely home. They called it Sudding's Mead. They called it the liquid of Odrir. Oh, oh, sorry. They called it the liquid of Odrir, or Bodin, or Sun. Odin listened to his raven's words. He called for his cloak and his hat. He sent for the gods and told them to prepare three enormous wooden vats, the largest vats that they could build, and to have them waiting by the gates of Asgard. He told the gods he would be leaving them to walk the world, and it might be some time. I will take two things with me, said Odin. I need, the wet, I need a whetstone to sharpen a blade with, the finest we have here, and I wish to have the auger, the drill called Roddy. Roddy means drill, and Roddy was the finest drill the gods possessed. It could drill deeply and drill through the hardest rock. Odin tossed the whetstone into the air and caught it again and put it into his pouch beside the auger. Then he walked away. I wonder what he's going to do, said Thor. Vasir would have known, said Frigg. He knew everything. Vasir is dead, said Loki. As for me, I do not care where the Allfather is going or why. I am off to help build the wooden vats that the Allfather uh, requested, said Thor. Sudding had given the precious mead to his daughter Gunlid to watch over inside the mountain called uh, called Nitbjorg in the heart of giant count in the heart of giant country. Sorry, these are not the easiest words to pronounce. Trust me. <laughs> Odin did not go to the mountain. Instead, he went directly to the farmland owned by Sutton's brother Bogi. It was the spring, and the fields were high with grasses to be cut for hay. Bogey had nine slaves. Well, it's, uh, sorry, it's Baugi. Baugi had nine slaves, giants like himself, and they were cutting the grass for hay with huge scythes, with each scythe the size of a small tree. Odin watched them. When they stopped work, when the sun was at its highest, to eat their provisions, Odin sauntered over to them and said, I've been watching you work all day, watching you all work. Tell me, why does your master let you cut grass with such blunt scythes? Our blades are not blunt, said one of the workers. Why would you say that, asked another. Our blades are the sharpest. Let me show you what a well-sharpened blade can do, said Odin. He took the whetstone from his pouch and drew it along first one scythe blade, then another, until each blade glimmered in the sun. The giants stood around him awkwardly watching him as he worked. Now, said Odin, try them out. The giant slaves swept their sides through the meadow grass and gasped and exclaimed with pleasure. The blades were, show, were so sharp they made cutting the grass effortless. The blades swept through the thickest stalks and met with no resistance. This is wonderful, they told Odin. Can we buy your whetstone? Buy it, said the Allfather. Absolutely not. Let us do something fit, more fair and more fun. All of you come here. Stand in a group, each man holding his scythe tightly. Stand closer. We can stand no closer, said one of the giant slaves, for the scythes are very sharp. You are wise, said Odin. He held up the whetstone. I tell you this, the one of you who catches it, he alone shall have it. And, saying, and so saying, he tossed the whetstone into the air. Nine giants jumped at the whetstone as the, and as, as it descended, and reaching with his free hand, paying no attention to the scythe he held, each scythe with a blade sharpened by the Allfather at, at his whetstone, wetted to a perfect sharpness. They jumped, and they reached, a, and the blades glinted in the sun. There was a spray and a spurt of crimson in the sunlight, and the bodies of the slaves crumpled and twitched. One by one, they fell to the freshly cut grass. Odin stepped over to the bodies of the giants, retrieved the whetstone of the gods, and placed it back in his pouch. Each of the nine slaves had died with his own throat cut by his fellow's blade. Odin walked to the hall of Baugi, Sudding's brother, and asked for lodging for the night. I am called Bolk, uh, Bolverker. 
said Odin. Volverker, said Baugi. A dismal name. It means worker of terrible things. Only to my enemies, said the person who called himself Volverker. My friends appreciate the things I do. I can do the work of nine men, and I will work tirelessly and without complaint. Lodging for the night is yours, said Baugi. Sighing, but you will... But... You have come to me on a dark day. Yesterday I was a rich man with many fields and with nine slaves to plant and to harvest, to labor and to build. Tonight I still owe my fields and my animals, but all my servants are dead. They slew each other, and I know not why. Um, a dark day indeed, said Bolverker, who was Odin. Can you not get other workmen? Not this year, said Baugi. It is already spring. The good workers are already working for my brother Sutton, and a few enough people come here in the, in the way of things. You were the first traveler who was asking for lodging and hospitality in many a year, and lucky you are that I did, for I can do the work of nine men. You are not a giant, said Baugi. You are a little shrimp of a thing. How could you do the work of one of my servants, let alone nine of them? If I cannot do the work of your nine men, said Bolverker, then you need not pay me. But if I do, yes, even in the distant parts we have heard tales about your brother Sutton's extraordinary mead. They say it bestows the, bif the gift of poetry on anyone who drinks it. Ah, this is true. Sutton was never a poet when he were young. I was the poet in the family. But since he has returned with the dwarf's mead, he has become a poet and a dreamer. If I work for you, and plant and build and harvest for you, and do the work for your dead servants, I would like to taste your brother Sutton's mead. But, Baugi's forehead creased, but that is not mine to give, it is Sutton's. A pity, said Bolverker, that I wish you luck in your getting the harvest in this year. Wait, it is not mine, true. But if you can do what you say, I will go with you to see my brother, Sutton, and I will do all I can to help you to taste his mead. Then said Bolverker, we have a deal. Never there was a harder worker than Bolverker. He worked the land harder than twenty men, let alone nine. Single-handed he looked after the animals. Single-handed he harvested the crops. He worked the land, and the land repaid him a thousandfold. Bolverker, said Bogey, as the first mists of winter rolled down the mountain, you are misnamed, for you have done, for you have worked nothing but good. Have I done the work of nine men? You have, and nine again. Then will you help me get a taste of Sutton's mead? I shall. The next morning they rose early and walked and walked and walked, and by evening they had left Bogey's land and reached Sutton's on the edge of the mountains. By nightfall, they reached Sutton's huge hall. Oh, I need a drink. <laughs> Odin is actually really, really nice. Like, it's the other ones who are jerks, you know? Okay, so where was I? Ah, greetings, brother Sutting, said Baugi. This is Bolverker, my servant for the summer and my friend. And he told Sutting of his agreement with Bolverker. So you see, he concluded, I must ask you to give him a taste of the meat of poetry. Sutting's eyes were like chips of ice. No, he said, flatly. No, said Baugi. No, I will not give away a single drop of that mead. Not one drop. I have it safe in its vats, in Bowden and Son and the Kettle O'Drear. Those vats are deep inside the mountain of, uh, of Nitbjorg, which opens only to my command. My daughter, Gunlet, guards it. This servant of yours cannot taste it. You cannot taste it. But, said Baugi, it was blood compensation for our parents' deaths. Don't I deserve the smallest measure of it? To show Bolverker here that I am an honorable giant? No, said Sutting, you don't. They left his hall. Bogey was, dis was disconsolate. 
He walked with his shoulders hunched high and his mouth drooping down. Every few paces, Balgi would apologize to Bolverker. I did not think my brother would be so unreasonable, he would say. He is indeed unreasonable, said Bolverker, who was Odin in disguise. But you and I could play a little trick or two on him, so that he would not be so high and might in, in future, so that next time he will listen to his brother. We could do that, said the giant Balgi, and he stood straighter, and the corner of his mouth tightened into something that almost resembled a smile. What are we going to do? First, said Bolverker, we will climb Nipjorg, the beating mountain. They climbed Nipjorg together, the giant going first and Bolverker, doll sized in comparison, never falling behind. They clambered up the paths and the mountain sheep and goats uh, that, that the mountain sheep and goats made. And then they scrambled up rocks and until they were high in the mountain, the first snows of winter had fallen on the ice that had not melted from the winter before. They heard the wind as it whistled about the mountain. They heard the cries of birds far below them. And, uh, and it, there was something else they could hear. It was a noise like a human voice. It seemed to be coming from the rocks of, uh, from the rocks of the mountain, but it was always distant as it were coming from inside the mountain itself. What noise is that? asked Bolverker. Balgi frowned. It sounds like my niece Gunnlod singing. Well, then, we must, we will stop here. From his leather pouch, Bolverker produced the auger called Roddy. Here, he said, you are a giant and big and strong. Why don't you use this auger to drill into the side of the mountain? Balgi took the auger. He pushed it against the mountainside and began to twist. The tip of the auger drilled into the mountainside with a screw and a soft cork. With Oh, like a screw into a soft cork. Balgi turned it and turned it again and again. Done, said Balgi. He pulled out the auger. Bolverker leaned over the hole made by the drill and blew into it. Chips and the dust of rocks blew back at him. I have just learned two things, said Bolverker. What things are these? asked Balgi. We are not yet through the mountain, said Bolverker. You must keep drilling. That is only one thing, said Balgi. But Bolverker said nothing more on that high mountainside, where the icy winds clawed and clutched at them. Balgi pushed the drill Roddy back into its hole and began to turn it once more. It was getting dark when Balgi pulled the auger from the hole again. It broke through into the side of the mountain, he said. Bolverker said nothing. He blew gently into the hole, and this time he saw the chips of rock blow inward. And he, as he blew, he was aware that something was coming toward him from be, uh, behind. Bolverker transformed himself then and turned himself into a snake, and the sharp auger plunged into the place where his head had been. The second thing I learned when you lied to me, hissed the snake to Balgi who stood astonished holding the auger like a weapon, was that you would betray me. And with a flick of his tail, the snake vanished into the hole in the mountainside. Balgi struck again with the auger, but the snake was gone, and he flung the drill from him angrily and heard it clatter on the rocks below. He thought about going back to Sunning's Hall, and once again, and once he was there telling his brother that he had helped bring a powerful magician up Nipdorg, but even <laughs> had even helped him to get inside the mountain. He imagined Sutton's reaction to this news, and then his shoulders slumping and his mouth drooping, Bogey climbed down the mountain and trudged off home, to his own hearth and his own hall. Whatever happened in the future to his brother or to his brother's precious mead, why, it was nothing to do with him. Bolverker slid in snake, snake, in snake shape through the hole in the mountain until the hole ended, and he found himself in a huge cavern. The cavern was lit by crystals with a cold light. Odin, trans Odin transformed himself from snake shape into man shape once more. And not just a man, but a huge man, giant-sized and well-formed. Then he walked forward, following the sound of song. Gunlud, the daughter of Sudding, stood in the cavern in front of in front of a locked door. 
behind which were the vats called Sun and Bowden and the Catalodra Rear. She held a sharp sword in her hands, and she sang to herself as she, as she, as she stood. Well met, brave maiden, said Odin. Dang it. There, right. Eat a drink. Ah, I gotta see what time it is. Um, if it's getting too late, I'm probably gonna have to uh, quit a little early. Oh, it's already 6.15. Um, I'm gonna save this. Uh, I'm gonna save it on here, and I'm gonna save it, I'm gonna, sa I'm put it, I'm gonna put it up onto, uh, uh, YouTube. Um, you'll be able to find it, I'll label it as, uh, the first half of, um, uh, what's it called? Let me go back to the beginning and find the beginning of it. Jeez, I read a lot. Wow. I read almost half of it. This is a long story, though. Okay, so it'll be called The Meat of Poets, uh, Part 1. Um, uh, I'll, uh, on here, it'll just be, you know, labeled as Norse Mythology, and you can find it um, if you missed any of it or you want to hear it again. Um, uh, and then I'll put this and the second part will both go up on YouTube, and I'll label them both The Meat of Poets, Part 1 and Part 2. So it will be available, um, just to let you know. Uh, thanks for, um, everyone, thanks for being here. Uh, I will get this finished. I will finish it tomorrow, okay? Um, I know I have to do the, uh, I've got the, um, Sea of Thieves. I'm doing the Tall Tale number 9 tomorrow, uh, which is the, the last of the original Tall Tales. And then after that... I will read the second half of the Meat of Poets. So, um, join me then. I, I hope, uh, I hope to see you, uh, see you, I hope to see you all there. And, uh, you know, like I said, if you miss it here, you can always catch it on YouTube. Um, it'll, it stays on here for a little while. Um, and then YouTube.